Hello everyone. We are going to be recording some videos so that you can review anatomy prior to talking about pathology. So in this video, as you can see, we're going to be doing a quick overview of the structure and function, the anatomy, movement principles related to the shoulder girdle. You should be watching this prior to the lecture that we're going to do in class on shoulder pathologies. So if you're ready, let's go. There is a in the shoulder pathology lecture notes, just about the first page, page and a half, is related to anatomy. So you may want to pull that up so that you can take some notes. This should be a familiar picture. We, it shows you the four different joints of the shoulder girdle. We are going to be looking at the sternoclavicular joint, the chromioclavicular joint, the glenohumeral joint. Remember, those are the three true anatomical joints of the shoulder girdle. And then we have one more joint, the scapulothoracic joint, which is a functional joint that we will also be assessing. So we're going to start with the sternoclavicular joint. The sternoclavicular joint is composed of articulation between the clavicle and then between the top of the sternum or the manubrium. It does have an articular disc in between it. And remember, the disc serves the purpose of deepening the articulation, it serves the purpose of increasing the stability of the joint, and it also helps to um, diminish the wear and tear of the joint. This is a saddle joint. It does have three degrees of freedom. And so remember, a saddle joint means that with one motion, a motion in one plane, the manubrium will be the concave element, and the clavicle will be the convex element, and that's for the motions of elevation and depression. And then in the other plane, the manubrium will be the convex member, and the clavicle will be the concave. And that is what the situation for protraction and retraction. The other motion that occurs at the sternoclavicular joint is that posterior rotation. And that occurs just around the longitudinal axis through the length of the clavicle. And this is only during times that when we elevate the humerus or raise our arm over our head. This is an automatic motion, so you can't just sit there and posteriorly rotate the clavicle. So the planes of motion again, um, elevation and depression, protraction and retraction, and then a posterior rotation. There's color coding here, and so it helps you remember plane and axis and convex member. So remember the axis of motion always goes through the convex portion of the joint. So for protraction and retraction, that's um, essentially in the front in the horizontal plane so there's a vertical axis and since it's going through the manubrium that of course means the manubrium is the convex portion and we saw that we saw that here the manubrium is the convex portion for elevation and depression that's in the frontal plane so there's our AP axis through the clavicle and sure enough color-coded there's the convex portion through the clavicle. And then again, finally, the posterior rotation actually takes place uh, in the sagittal plane. The longitudinal axis running through the clavicle, of course, runs the course of the clavicle side to side or medial lateral. The other significance of the sternoclavicular joint is it serves as the only attachment for the entire upper extremity to the axial skeleton. And this results in the shoulder girdle being a very mobile complex, but not a very stable one. And then we have to there, therefore rely on muscles for stability. Let's go on to the acromial clavicular joint. This is an articulation between the end of the clavicle, lateral end of the clavicle, and the acromion. It's mostly a gliding joint, and again it does have three degrees of freedom. Sometimes there's a little disc in between there as well. It's a very stable joint. There's not much motion, and we see a lot of very strong ligaments. We see uh, coracoclavicular ligaments running, of course, from the coracoid process up to the clavicle. Those are divided into the conoid and trapezoid ligaments. Again, strong acromial clavicular ligament binding the clavicle and the acromion process together. We'll look again at the motions that are occurring here when we look at scapulohumeral rhythm. 
We have the glenohumeral joint, and most of the time when people talk about their shoulder problems, they, they mean glenohumeral joint problems, but of course we know the, comp the mechanics of motion are pretty complicated, so we always have to be considering all the joints of the shoulder girdle. You see here the joint capsule, and there are some thin capsular ligaments that reinforce that capsule, and one that actually gets a name called the coracohumeral ligament. We do know that um, we see a very shallow glenoid fossa holding a very large convex humeral head. And so we know that this joint is not inherently very stable from either a bony standpoint or from the ligaments since they are pretty thin. And so gravity really does pull on that, the weight of the upper extremity and the head of the humerus. And so in the absence of muscles, that the rotator cuff muscles stabilizing the joint, that joint would sublux or become unstable. Other elements of this joint structure that are important to note are um, the fact that the head of the, the long head of the biceps comes up and comes over the top of the humeral head. We see a couple bursa in here to try to protect the head of the humerus and the head of, and the tendon of the biceps, and then also above that the tendon of the supraspinatus from the overlying acromion process. The ligaments. I'm sorry, the joint capsule of the glenohumeral joint is very large and loose. This also contributes to the mobility of the glenohumeral joint. You can see here this little axillary pouch. Remember the joint capsule kind of hangs down a little bit here. And see if you remember why is there this space in the joint capsule inferior to the, gleno, to the glenoid fossa? It's to allow for the inferior slide of the humeral head during elevation activities of the humerus. So we're going to look at some pathologies in class where there's a lot of tightness in this capsule. Therefore, the head of the humerus can't slide down, and so we see people very limited in motions like flexion and abduction. This is kind of an odd view, but it's a uh, lateral view with, of the glenoid fossa and the rest of the scapula without the humerus attached. And we see in here, uh, again, the subacromion bursa, and then directly below that we see the supraspinatus. As I mentioned, that bursa is shielding or protecting the supraspinatus from wear and tear against the acromion process. We see the coracoacromial arch that's created by the acromion process coracoacromial ligament and the coracoid process, that just serves as a, as kind of a superior protection for the glenohumeral joint. The other muscles, of course, of the rotator cuff are the infraspinatus and the teres minor, posteriorly, and then anteriorly we have the subscapularis. Those are all going to be providing a medial compressive line of pull on the head of the humerus to help stabilize it against the glenoid fossa. They'll also protect the head of the humerus from sliding inferiorly due to gravity. Lastly, let's look at the scapulothoracic joint and the motions occurring there. So the motions, we have elevation and depression, and that's just a planar motion, the scapula just sliding inferiorly and superiorly. We have protraction and retraction another planar motion, the scapula just kind of abducting and adducting on the posterior part of the thorax. And then finally we have upward and downward rotation. That is a rotational motion. We put a pretend AP axis through the scapula and then we have upward and downward rotation occurring in the frontal plane. Let's review scapulothoracic rhythm. In order for the person to get their arm all the way over the head, we have to have interaction of all four of these joints. So we have elevation occurring at the SC joint. We have upward rotation occurring at the AC joint. So see if you remember how many um, degrees occur at each of those. So see, this is like a little equation. Here's the AC joint upward rotation plus the SC joint elevation equals scapulothoracic upward rotation. So see if you can remember how many degrees takes place. So how many degrees total of upward rotation do we have? Right, 60 degrees. 
So how much of that comes from the SC joint? Right, good job, 30 degrees. And then of course the other 30 degrees comes from the AC joint. So I mentioned earlier most of the motions at the AC joint are just gliding, but in this case there is an, an, a rotational motion that occurs of 30 degrees. So in order to get the arm over the head, of course the other 120 degrees to get our full 180 degrees of elevation, of course, comes from the glenohumeral joint. So whether we're talking about abduction, flexion, or somewhere in between. So as we move on and, and start talking about pathologies in class later, you're going to have to recall back to these mechanics, and a lot of the pathologies we're going to talk about are because these mechanics have been disrupted. So we will be exploring that in the pathologies. If there are any other areas, if you want to review muscles, muscles attachments, go over this uh, mechanics in more detail, I would refer you back to your, your kinesiology textbook and certainly your kinesiology notes. I'm sure many of you made flashcards for the muscles. This is a great opportunity for you really to review and internalize that information, not just have it blindly memorized for, a, for an exam, but really start to internalize and understand it because you do need to understand this muscle function in order to be able to create appropriate and um, effective exercises. All right, I will see you in class. Thank you.